Good evening and welcome to National Lewis University's NLU Career Academy. This is our third installment and it has been a wonderful program here over the past year. So we're so pleased that you have joined us. I hope we have some repeat attendees here in the audience. I'm Julie Bechtold. I'm the Director of Career Development and this uh, Academy is being brought to you in partnership with NLU's Career Development Office, Alumni Office Institutional Advancement, and the Career Transition Center. So tonight we're going to be talking about networking for connection and opportunity. Yes, I'm reading that right. So I'd like to introduce our speaker to you. Getting a job, advancing in your career, it all comes down to connection. Networking is about genuine connection. It's your way of getting to know those who know and those who can help. And it's also an opportunity for you to help others as well. A few people at Career Transition Center personify the how and why of networking better than our speaker tonight, Laura Kearney. In navigating her own transition, Laura can speak firsthand about the value of conversation and connection. Laura is currently a graduate student at the Chicago School of Professional Psychology, where she's pursuing her master's in psychology with a concentration, I'm sorry, she's pursuing a master's in counseling psychology, <laughs> very important, with a concentration in trauma and crisis intervention. She is orchestrating her own career metamorphosis, having had a successful career in sales calling on architects in Chicago and the West Coast. Again, she'll speak from her own experience tonight, transitioning her career one conversation, one relationship at a time. Please welcome Laura Kearney. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks so much for coming tonight. Hi. Um, as Julie said, my name is Laura Kearney, and I come to you by way of the Career Transition Center. Um, CTC is a volunteer-driven nonprofit organization that serves mid-career professionals and by providing professional and emotional support to those who are seeking work, looking for more meaningful work, or undergoing any type of career transition. And a National Lewis University is a sponsor of ours. Um, and our services include weekly coaching, um, peer groups, it's one-on-one -on -one coaching. We have over 250 programs that we do annually that are related to job search and career transition. We also have a virtual services online program for those who might live outside of the Chicago area or prefer to do their work and be coached by phone from the comfort of their home. Um, and I am a former CTC client myself, and then I was a volunteer, and now I'm actually a programming intern, and I help uh, Laura Sterkel out, director of programming, with all that is related at CTC. And as Julie said, I am also attending um, the Chicago School right now. So we're gonna dive right into the presentation. I'm gonna ask you at certain times if you have any questions, and if you do, um, please kind of let us know. Somebody's walking, going to be um, walking around with a microphone to make sure that the folks who are joining us by streaming can hear your questions. I may also repeat those questions if I think they didn't get a chance to, uh, to hear it. So today's agenda, we're basically going to be talking about what makes a difference in this job market, how you find opportunities, the new school and new thoughts about networking. Um, Think more about what it is that you really want in your next job. Um, the art of the ask, how asking and how you do it is so important. Um, and communicating your pre professional value, but also defining your work values. And then we're going to talk a little bit about LinkedIn and networking, a um, little bit about follow-up, and then there's going to be another period of time for questions. The um, if you're looking for work, chances are you already know that networking is really important, um, but, and you're probably aware of some of the basics, but what you might not know is why it's so important. And some of you might be just really uncomfortable with networking, and the good news is, kind of like the intro, that the best networking happens um, when it's one-on-one -on -one targeted networking that's sincere and comfortable. It's just a conversation with somebody. 
And when the networking is properly done, it's truly about connecting with the right people, not the most people, and that's important, um, in order to find opportunities that be best fit your work experience and your values. Um, and today we're gonna concentrate on taking a closer look, as I said, at what you really want and how making some simple changes in your approach are gonna improve your networking results. So this quote I love, it always makes people chuckle. Um, but it also applies to your networking activity. At CTC, we always stress and teach our clients that the importance of a self-directed job search. You learn how to do it for yourself, so when it comes down the pike again, you know exactly what to do. And taking a charge of your networking is gonna be the best way for you to find new job opportunities. So if you're here today, I am assuming that you are in the Making Things Happen group. Um, so welcome to the club, and nice to meet you. So I will tell you that I lovingly crafted this new presentation for you, so I apologize about the notes. I usually hate notes, but I need them as a little bit of a crutch tonight. Um, the great networkers in this current job market know that they have to be able to speak effectively about their professional experience and goals, as well as promote the value to the prospective employer. So today we're going to focus on ways that we can do that better. And the number one thing that's gonna make or break your job search is your commitment to the process of it. Job search has changed, as you can see up here, pretty dramatically in the last five years. And what used to work well just doesn't cut it anymore. Um, applying to jobs online used to be the thing that worked. Now it doesn't work so well. Um, online networking, as you can see, was non-existent or considered to be minimally effective, and only about half of the people found their jobs through networking. But today, the number of people who are finding their jobs through networking is actually estimated to be as high as 90%. Um, we also change positions more often now, and um, as often as every 2.5 years, according to a recent um, national longitudinal study on baby boomers. Um, they track people ages 18 to 48 years old. And all this job changing and career or exploration means that we're gonna need help from others. And what it really means is that we cannot afford to not be great at networking. Many of you have probably heard of this mysterious thing called the hidden job market. And um, we're, gonna, we're gonna talk a little bit more about what that is. And the hidden job market, what it boils down to, and I'll explain this a little more, is 75% of jobs and new opportunities come out of networking. And what that also means is 75% of jobs and new opportunities are never even advertised. So a lot of times we think that our target companies aren't hiring anybody, and in reality, they are. It's just that those positions are never making it in, onto the streets and never making it into the ads because they get filled before it even gets to that point. And I'll explain that a little bit more. Um, so you might be a little fuzzy on what the concept of it is. Um, it's very simple. And as I said, 75% of the jobs get filled before they even get advertised. And people are like, well, how does that work? So I kind of break it down into the phases of a new job. Um, we often think that our experience and what we know should speak for ourselves in the job market, but often, unfortunately, what it really boils down to is who we know. So if you're looking at the four phases of a job, a new job becomes available. The hiring manager, the first thing that the hiring manager is going to do is they're going to look within the company. They're going to look within that department or the company because they want to hire somebody within the company first. It's really easy for them. They don't have to spend the money to hire, to hire a recruiter or to run an ad, so that's the first place they go. If they strike out there, phase two is they're gonna go to other employees and they're gonna say, look, I'm looking for somebody in your department. Do you have anybody great that you can recommend to me? And quite often, they, are, they get some really good recommendations, they find somebody and they're done right there. If that doesn't work, the last phase is that quite often they'll reach out to other colleagues in the industry and say, I'm looking for somebody in this department. Have you come across anybody that you know? And they might get some recommendations that way. 
So if all of that strikes out, then the hiring manager breaks down and finally runs an ad or hires a recruiter. So when I'm telling you that all these jobs are getting filled before they even hit the street, that's how it's happening. And that's another reason why when I talk and talk and talk about how important networking is, that's what I mean. You don't have a chance at 75% of those jobs unless you've networked your way into your target organization, met some of the influencers, met some of the decision makers, and if you have, you'll be top of mind when a new position comes up. They'll say, oh yeah, I just met Trudy. She was amazing. I would love for you know, her to come in and talk to you. And then you also have a lot more power going into an interview when you have a personal recommendation, okay? Um, so unfortunately, there's also another thing that happens that I think all of us may have experienced. You get all excited because you finally see an ad and then you follow up on it and they tell you it's filled. Well, some companies, that's a requirement that they actually have to advertise the job and sometimes they do it after they've already hired somebody. It's frustrating but true. So um, if a job makes it to phase four and your resume makes it through that crazy applicant tracking system you've spent your whole life working on the keywords for, um, you, um, with, if you get to have that interview, you're in a position where yes, you got through and you got to the interview, but without, again, those contacts and those ins at that target organization, you're really not in a better position than anybody else that made it into phase four with you, if you get my meaning. Um, so I'm not saying that you can't find a job the old fashioned way. Um, sometimes people say lightning strikes. Um, but getting your odds, the odds of getting the job without networking are pretty low. So to find opportunities, you need to work your way into the hidden job market, make connections and build relationships in the places that you want. And this is just, again, really right here on the right side, talking about how important building those relationships are. So we're gonna talk about old school networking and new school networking yes, yeah, uh, next. And um, take a look at your, this is the average person's network or kind of the way they think about it, okay? So, you're, so you find out that you're gonna start looking for a new job or you got laid off from your position and usually people go right there to the inner circle and to their friends, those two. And they think, all the people I know the best, I'm gonna go to them first and they're gonna, they're gonna really wanna help me because I know them the best, okay? Well, the interesting thing is that they know a lot of the same people that you know and they might be in the same industry so they hear all the same stuff that you do. So in reality, this core that you think is so strong for you might not be the strongest place. Um, the, when you go to, you know, go to that core first, might get some leads, might not. So then you start branching out into allies and colleagues and maybe you branch out to acquaintances. And, um, but a lot of people are you know, hesitant to go beyond this inner circle and the friends. Um, they, they, don't, they might be uncomfortable reaching out to the, the um, professional allies or colleagues that they have that they know less. And, um, and then by the time they start thinking about acquaintances, they go, oh, those people really can't do anything for me. That, what, you know, I barely know them, so I'm not gonna bother with them. Um, these are people in acquaintances that maybe you've t lost touch with over time, or you barely know them, you met them through somebody else and you never followed up, and now you feel uncomfortable about it. So you've just kind of let these people go. You might be connected to them on LinkedIn, but you have really very little contact with them. I, I know that we all have those. Um, so this group often gets ignored as a source of support. So this is the new school. This is sort of the new way of looking at it. And what you're gonna focus on, instead of your inner circle of people that already know you inside out, you're gonna focus on trying to get to the decision makers. And decision makers are people who can offer you a position. Um, and instead of focusing on that, um, you're gonna focus on trying to get to influencers, and those are people that would, as I said in the hiring manager example, those are the people who would recommend people they know to a decision maker if they were looking. Um, and you can meet the influencers through what we call mavens and connectors. If anybody in here is a Malcolm Gladwell fan and read Tipping Point, some of this is gonna sound familiar to you. Um, 
but mavens are motivated to educate and help others. And connectors are those people, and we all know a couple of them, um, who have an amazing knack for making friends and new acquaintances everywhere that they go. They, they just seem to know everyone, okay? So they're also gonna help you because they can get you to decision makers or they can get you to the influencers. Um, now we get to these weak ties and these acquaintances that I mentioned before. And this is, these are gonna be the ones who really surprise you because research shows that 58% of people who find new jobs find them through their weak ties and their acquaintances. The inner circle that I was talking about before, that's like 16%. So I'm flipping on its ear what you probably have been thinking is more effective in the past. Um, and the reason is kind of what I said before. Um, these weak ties and acquaintances, they travel in different circles than we do. They know different people than we do. Um, they've got different information. So you really want to start thinking about this and think about who are the weak ties that you have just thought, oh, this, you've just written them off for some reason. I would really challenge you to take a look at those people and reach out to them. Um, I know that I, you know, I went through job search when I decided to switch from sales and I went back to college. And so I've been there and recently um, and I know that it's you know, a little bit uncomfortable to reach out to some of these people, but I found a very interesting thing. Many times they are very happy to hear from you and very willing to help you. Um, and some of the people that we really think we can count on end up not being there for us, you know, really being there for us at all. So um, dormant ties, um, this other term down here on the bottom, these are the people that we used to know a long time ago. I mentioned them before, but we have fallen out of touch with for one reason or another. For the same reason you think, oh, it's been five years, or oh, I worked with them 10 years ago. You know, what are they gonna think? They're gonna be happy to get a call from you, and they're gonna wanna help you. Everybody's been in the same position. And when they, you know, they'll remember when they were in that position, they needed somebody to help them. So does anybody have any questions right about now? No? Okay. So one of the other things that's really important in uh, your job search is to sort of separate your anybody's from your somebody's, okay? And what I'm talking about there is a lot of times people say, hey, um, who's, who should be in my network, Laura? Who's supposed to be in my network? That's like a very popular question that everybody wants to know. Um, and one of the things that we talk about at CTC is that people get really hung up on how many people they have on Facebook and how many connections they have on LinkedIn. Um, but in reality, if these are not strong relationships with people that you can call to help you and they will be you know, willing to drop what they're doing and help you, then this whole numbers game in our head is really an illusion, yeah? Um, so it doesn't matter how many contacts we have, um, we call them shallow contacts. If they're people that you, you, you'd say, I, you know, I wouldn't even reach out to that person actually. Like I'm really not sure why I'm connected to them professionally. And, um, and so those are the people that you wanna kind of rethink that situation. And what I also recommend is once a year kind of reviewing who's in your network. Go through your LinkedIn connections, see who's in there. Think about who have I had any contact with over the last year? Would I feel comfortable reaching out? And the other thing is would I feel comfortable helping them if they asked me? Yes? I am a huge fan, and I talk about this later, of email because making email requests, you have exactly what you want in writing. I talk about how to actually ask later for the help, um, but you can also uh, put a link to your LinkedIn. Um, you should do that anyway. You should have a link, a link to your LinkedIn account in your signature um, on your smartphone and on your email. And, um, but then you can also attach a resume because a lot of times people say, oh, he knows what I do. I, I, don't, I don't need to go into what my strengths or experience are because she knows what I do. 
that's a terrible approach because you're not giving them enough information, and I talk about that. So, um, so I would definitely you know, think about what do you want them to know. I would make your um, reconnection brief. Um, you know, everything about networking is helping people and giving something back. So a lot of times you might say, oh my gosh, I saw, you know, it might be somebody who's in love with, um, I don't know, bull terriers, okay? So you might say, oh, I saw this funny picture of a bull terrier or this book at the store the other day and I thought of you. Or it might be a news story or a lot of times there are books related to business or um, networking that I read and I'll just put like a little link directly to the page in Amazon and say this is great, this is a great book and this is why I thought you would like it, that type of thing. So it's kind of like a soft kind of way to reconnect with people that I like. So I was talking about reviewing your um, LinkedIn connections once a year. It's a great idea and I actually did this and I will completely cop to the fact that I sat there like over a four day period trying to get from 299 to 300 on my LinkedIn. Like I would check it like a few times a day, it was crazy. And so then I got to like 350 and I decided, okay, I have to like practice what I preach. And I went through and I cut like 35 people that really I had no contact with. And again, I wouldn't feel comfortable reaching out to them. And then I did it again. Okay, so watching those numbers go down was seriously uncomfortable. Um, it was funny, but I feel like what I'm doing is I'm, I'm you know, taking out the weaker contacts and then I'm, I'm being very deliberate about who I am adding as new contacts. So I'm actually building a stronger network. Um, and with people that are more invested in my success and, you know, and I in theirs. So I just think it's a much better approach. So as if I paid you money, look at what slide we're at. Asking, okay? So a lot of times we talk about how uh, uncomfortable we are asking anybody to help us at, with networking. Um, and it is very, very important how you ask. And I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go through that in, in detail today. Um, but how we reach out greatly affects the responses that we get or don't get. Um, so how you ask for help directly impacts the type of responses um, and also the, um, I would say, the time it takes to respond. And asking really broad and vague requests for assistance don't work. You don't want to ever ask anybody for a job. You're always just like, I always say, hey, I'm information gathering. And people are really open to that. If they feel like you're going to be asking them for a job on the phone or, or you want to meet for coffee and that's your objective, they're going to be nervous. They're going to be less inclined to do it. Um, so you're going to provide your, um, your contact with the information in writing. Um, so the contacts can refer back to your information at their own convenience, but also, and this is important, so they can forward it to others if they think of anybody that you should meet or, or you know, that might be interested in you as a, as a prospect for a job. Um, so I talk about how details really equal results. So you're gonna include the positions or the titles that you're actually seeking, the names of your target companies, um, and names of contacts at your target companies if you happen to know that, um, and also relevant experience and strengths that you possess. Again, I would, that whole thing about not assuming that they remember what you do. Um, and then also request introductions to any other relevant contacts, and if you, have their, if you know their names, then include that. And what I mean by that is, you know how wonderful LinkedIn is now and we can kind of take a look at who knows who and everything. So if you see that somebody has a connection that you would like to meet, um, as you could include that in your email as well. Does anybody remember this movie? In Jerry Maguire, famous line, help me help you. I think he's on his knees begging Cuba Gooding Jr. Um, he's so frustrated, he wants his information, he's begging for it, he's so stressed out and he's just yelling, help me, help you. So if you remember nothing else from today, please remember this. So we need to talk about um, how many of our own contacts are really stressed out. Many of them are doing the jobs of two people these days um, due to downsizing. And the last thing we want is to make them feel this frustrated. Um, so long emails and phone messages, um, giving them way too much information, but then not giving them very clear direction of what you're asking for, 
um, are really common problems when people are reaching out from help, for help from other people. Um, and it doesn't allow them to, to get back to us quickly and give us quick answers. So oftentimes it's not that they don't want to help us, it's that they open this long email from somebody and they go, oh my gosh, like I cannot deal with this right now, and they save it. Maybe they put a little star next to it if you're lucky. But, um, but we don't want that to happen, okay? And we also need to realize that we're probably operating on different clocks right now. What seems super urgent to us because of the position that we're in does not, that doesn't occur to them that you know we're probably sitting there staring at the phone like a teenager, um, and that we were like, please call, please call, you know. So um, so we have to just realize that and not take it personally. I get people asking me about this at CTC all the time, like somebody, you know, I called somebody two days ago and they haven't called me back. And you know, my advice is always give it a week. Um, like I said before, follow it up with something that might be helpful to them to kind of you know reconnect. And, um, and just saying, you know, I'm following up, I know you're busy, you know, would there be a time to talk, that type of thing. And again, you know, include the, the good information. So any questions about this section? Okay. So um, I talked about this before, you know, you're going you're gonna to want to kind of reiterate your um, professional background, your strengths and your accomplishments as they pertain to what you're inquiring about, if it's a specific job. Um, or if it's a, a target company. Um, you're gonna provide the information that's relevant to the request, less is more, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, you're gonna make it easier for the people that you want to help you to help you. And you're gonna utilize your contacts really well, respect their time, and always employ good social etiquette. So I have a story about this. A lot of times people will say to me, Laura, why would I wanna, why would I wanna take a contact out of LinkedIn that I don't have much to do with? Like, what's it hurt? Well, I've had a few instances where somebody has, without asking me, used my name for a job they were interviewing before. And one time, it was somebody that was on a board of a company that I volunteered at that I met once. So in that instance, she actually hurt herself because the person must have been saying, why are you using her name, you know? So there are ways that, that the connections can be kind of abused or misused. And that's why I'm saying that you should be real careful about um, who, you, you know, who you network with and who's in your, um, your connections for LinkedIn. Um, and then one thing that's really important, and I mentioned this before, is to always include um, the people that have helped you get to this contact. So if somebody said, I recommend that you try and have an informational interview with Joe Smith, and then Joe Smith says yes, then you go back to that person and you say, oh my gosh, I got the meeting with Joe Smith. Thank you so much for letting me use your name. After you meet with Joe Smith, you go back to that person and you say, what happened in my meeting with Joe Smith? And you thank them again. It's a lot of work, but this is, these are the people that are willing to help you in the first place. They will keep helping you as long as they realize that you're taking their advice and that you appreciate it, okay? So this is uh, an article that I just read the other day and uh, I loved it. And this gentleman was giving advice on how to get a busy person to respond to your email. So let's face it, you really can't connect or find opportunity if your contacts aren't returning your emails. Um, and so he's got these five little hints here and he talks about keeping the email short um, he talks about keeping it to two or three sentences. It's much easier to read right then. A longer paragraph or two, as I said, people will often put off reading and then it's gonna take you a lot longer to get a response. And then he talks about formatting it for readability. I would suggest that you write, now, write down the name of this article. You know what, you don't need to. I actually added it to the resources list at the end, so you don't need to. But what he does is he takes emails that he's received and he does email makeovers to them in a way that he says like, I wouldn't respond to this, but I would and here's why. So he does what I call email makeovers and they're very fascinating. So I highly recommend that you take a look at that. And so formatting for readability is a big one with him. Um, it's easier to read the emails that are broken down into like one or two sentences per paragraph instead of having a whole long paragraph. Um, make it very clear what you want them to do. And he talks about um, how people are constantly sending him all this information, but then they never tell him exactly what they wanted him to do. And um, again, that's about helping 
them help you. Also be reasonable with your request. He says a lot of times he gets emails where somebody dashes it off in 30 seconds, but it would take him hours to actually do what they want him to do. So he talks about being respectful of that. He says, um, actually, and I'm guilty of this myself, like, oh, hi, it's Laura. I just want to pick your brain about something. He says that's the biggest offense of all because it shows that, by, that you're not focused enough. You're not ready to have that conversation with the person, that you need to be much more prepared and narrow down what it is that you want to talk about. And then also he says, show me why I should take the time to help you. And what he's talking about here is just that time is at a premium, as we talked about before, and people will prioritize who they help. Um, especially if they don't know you, they're going to research you. So he talks about this is another way why your LinkedIn profile is so important. Because if somebody doesn't know who you are, you're reaching out to them, even if you are recommended by somebody they know, first thing they're going to do is Google you. And if you're on LinkedIn, that's going to be one of the first things that comes up. They're going to dink, and then they're going to go, oh, there you are. Hopefully, they're going to see your picture, because you should have a picture. And then they're going to start reading about you. So again, I get people asking me questions like, oh, why does my, my LinkedIn you know, profile doesn't matter that much? Like, when they meet me, they'll know. Well, sometimes you don't get to meet the person if the LinkedIn profile isn't intriguing or strong enough. Any questions? No, you guys are just writing, writing, writing. Good for you. So discovery, planning, and action are the phases that all job searches and career management go through. And the same thing basically applies to networking. In discovery, you're going to start seeking out new networking opportunities and industry organizations. You're going to practice your value statement with your peers that might be out of work as well, or with your career coach if you're doing any coaching. In planning, you're going to start defining who is in your network, and as I said, who should be in your network and who shouldn't be, maybe. Um, preparing a list of those that you're going to reach out to, and you're going to start doing informational interviews, interviews excuse me, and try to meet with those influencers and mavens and connectors that I talked about before who can get you to the decision makers at your target companies. And then in the action phase, you're going to attend relevant networking and industry events with a very solid message of what you do and what it is that you want. Um, and you'll be doing informational interviews and networking with those that are going to get you closer to the decision makers. So now we have a little exercise for you. And if you're looking to change fields like I was before, or even if you just want to shift your professional responsibilities to something that focuses more on your professional strengths, you're going to need to identify your work values and your priorities. So this, is the, this should be the first page in your handout. So you need to know this information to keep yourself on track to meet your career goals, um, but also to effectively communicate the information when you're networking or conducting informational interviews. So take a look at these work values um, and write down the ones that are most important to you. And eventually what you want to be able to do is narrow it down to the top five. When I did this exercise the first time, I circled like 15 things in the first um, minute. So that might happen to you. But it's a good thing to go back to. Um, I'm going to give you guys about five minutes to work on this. Um, but you can go back to it on your own time as well. And this is just about trying to um, you know, figure out what objectives here would, that you feel would bring you greater success, satisfaction, and meaning in your career and in your life. So take a few minutes to do this exercise right now.
Okay. Wanted to get you guys started on that, but I'm gonna move on. Um, one of the reasons that we like people to do this exercise is I, when I joined CTC, it was like five years ago, um, and you know, for the age I was at that time, I had really never thought about what was the most important thing to me. Like many people, um, and the coaches say this all the time, a lot of times we stumble into our first career and you know, 10, 15, 20 years later, we're still doing the same thing. We're so busy with everything going on that we've certainly maybe never stopped to consider you know, questions like this. So we kind of like to get, you know, to, to get the, uh, the wheels turning with this exercise. Um, and again, this is something that you can continue to work on. But does anybody have any comments or questions about it? Okay. So another topic you might be hearing a lot about is branding. And a lot of people say like, I don't understand what branding is. Like, I'm not Coca-Cola. Why do I need to have a brand? Like, what is it? What does it mean? And it's really just talking about who you are as a person and how you add value and how you want to be known in your business or field, okay? Um, so knowing your work values and your priorities are critical. Um, and this next step would be to think a little bit more about your brand. And your brand, like I said, it's what you want to be known for. It's what distinguishes you in your field. And it's less complicated than it sounds, so don't worry about it. Um, one of the main reasons we find that people are really uncomfortable with networking and asking for help is because they've skipped critical steps, like one of the steps that we just did and the one we're talking about now, about identifying what sets you apart from others who do what you do, and then knowing what it is that you really want for yourself professionally moving forward. This is a time that you can think about, okay, I really liked what I was doing before, and maybe I'm looking for the same exact thing. but if I could tweak this, this next position to really play more to the unique strengths that I have, um, what, what would I do and how would I do that? Um, so what might I change a little bit? If you were like me, you were changing everything and going back to school, um, and, and you really had to sit down and think about what it, uh, what it is that you want. Um, and so it's really hard to put yourself out there and network confidently and find the right target organizations if you're not very clear on these two areas. So over here on the right, you can't really distinguish yourself if you don't know what distinguishes you in the first place. I mean, it makes sense. Um, you're not really pitching yourself, it's just about how you professionally add value. Um, and it's conscious, consistent behavior, and this is where you can think of the big brands like Nike or Coca-Cola, but they've thought about who they are and who they wanna be, and every message that they put out there takes people back to that. And you can do that with yourself and your work as well. Um, and also, it's again, it's this articulation in the same way that's indelible and repeatable over and over. And also, I kind of think that there's like a little formula that you could use for what is your distinction. And it's a combination of you know, what you enjoy doing, what's made you successful, plus your strengths, plus how you have served organizations and individuals. So I have another exercise number two for you. And uh, as I was saying, you know, if you're a career changer or you're not really sure what value you bring or what does set you apart professionally, this is a nice place to start here. Um, we're gonna take a few minutes again for you to look over this list and um, choose your top five professional strengths. Um, and then if you, see, if you think you have some strength and you don't see it anywhere on here, write that down on your page too. Um, and again, this is something that you can continue to work on. Um, if you need more time, we'll just do, we'll give you guys a few minutes to get started on it today. But the question here is, you know, what do you offer that you think prospective employers would find the most valuable?
we're gonna move on, but I would say, if this is something that you struggle with in terms of knowing what your strengths are, because five years ago I, didn't, I couldn't have told you what my, type five, my top five were, sort of knew what I was good at, but you know, I, had, I couldn't really identify. Um, and I actually took a Strength Finders course at CTC, um, and that was really, really eye-opening to me, and it helped me realize in terms of trying to figure out what career I was gonna do next, I was able to realize that a lot of the strengths I had and what I enjoyed most about sales, oddly enough, transferred into becoming a therapist. So my top five strengths are connection, communication, input, um, empathy, <laughs> and, uh, and woo, which has something to do with I don't know, influence or something. But so the odd thing was that I could, I could honestly look at those five strengths and see how they, for me, had a lot to do with being in sales for years and being very successful in it. It doesn't speak to my soul, that's why I didn't want to do it anymore, but also how those things could apply to actually make me successful as a therapist or to make me good as a therapist as well, I should say. So. The next thing we want to talk about is how you communicate your value. And unfortunately, um, you know, if you are looking for work right now, one of your most asked and most dreaded questions is, so what do you do? I loved that one. I was like, do you have to ask me that again? Um, and unfortunately, most of us answer this question incorrectly. We talk about our work in terms of our field or our title or the company that we work for. Um, or the name of our employer. And if somebody asked me this five years ago, my answer would usually be something like, oh, I'm in sales, or I work in the merchandise mart, or I'm with Dalton Associates, you know, I work for Ventec. People are like, who's that, what is that? Like that doesn't mean anything to anybody. Um, and we're all guilty of making similar statements and you might still be doing that now, but when you're looking for a new job and you're networking, those types of responses really don't serve us. And they're not gonna open any kinds of doors to productive conversations with us that are gonna help us with networking. So um, look at these three examples here for some inspiration. And um, this person saying, you know, we've got kind of a formula up here, I help who? to do what by how you do it. So this person that's a senior financial operations manager saying I help organizations optimize financial operations and processes for cost savings and greater efficiency. I would probably even break that down into something more basic because that kind of goes like this on me. Um, but, but it's a start. Um, example two, I attract and advance the best, most profitable and most enduring client relationships. Okay. I was in sales before, so I'm kind of like, how does that guy do that? What does he mean? So I'd probably be a little intrigued by that. Um, number three, I help organizations and individ individuals realize their potential. That's a pretty great, that's a pretty intriguing comment right there. And that's an executive coach. So I talk about doing what do you do better, okay? And this is one way that you can do it. It's not your title or your position, or what, but what you actually do concerns the problems that you've solved for your employers in the past, what distinguishes you professionally, um, what it is that you are passionate about in your work, and then also the value that you add to the organizations that you work for or have worked for. So when you provide this more engaging answer, it's gonna open the door to more meaningful connections and exchanges with people. And that's what you want. That's how you meet new people and build new networks. That's how you are memorable. That's how you engage in better conversations that people are gonna remember down the line. So I've broken this up into sort of old and new here. So a person that's a career coach might say, hey, I'm a career coach. Or they'd say, you know, I help people look for work in the right way so it's less stressful, more fun, and they get better results faster. Um, I'm a sales representative is the next one. I attract and grow loyal client relationships. Um, I'm an event planner. I plan and deliver the most memorable parties. Well, I love a party. You probably love a party. I want to know how they make the most memorable parties. Um, what we're going to do now is an exercise uh, where 
you are going to start to think about how you would reposition your statement about what it is that you do, okay? And um, you've got a uh, page in your handout that's got the examples, and it's got um, three little areas for you to write those in. So let's take some time for you guys to start crafting some new answers to that question, okay? So in the interest of time, I'm going to suggest that maybe when we wrap up, you guys can try out some of these on each other to get some feedback. Um, but this what do you do question, it's the number one question that most of us are asked um, in job search, but also in our social life. I mean, any party that you go to, anytime you meet somebody new. So having a really strong answer um, for what you do professionally is really going to serve you well. And with this new type of response that I'm talking about, um, you're simply talking about what sets you apart um, professionally, what excites you and wh what you really love about what you do. And your enthusiasm for what you do is going to naturally come across and it's going to make you more memorable to the people that you meet. Um, also for, to keep in touch with them down the line, but for future networking or referrals. Um, you're going to enjoy this type of conversation much more than trying to remember like a three minute long elevator, what is it even called now, elevator speech, your pitch. Um, but, and it's just going to start, you know, it's going to start up a more interesting conversation. And then what's cool about this is that 
what normally happens is then you flip it around on the other person and they start answering you kind of the way you answered them and it just gets a much better conversation going. Um, if your response elicits, you know, responses like, oh, really? Or how do you do that? Or could you tell me about that? Or could you explain that? Then you're definitely on the right track, okay? Um, and the beauty of this approach, like I said, is that once we start talking in this manner, um, the conversation will flip around to the other person in the same manner as well. And don't drop the ball here. Um, request contact information and follow up with new contacts um, and request connections to them on LinkedIn because research shows that 60 to 70 percent of people admit that they don't follow up with, with their new contacts. Um, so that's basically a, a lot of hard work that you've done that's lost for no reason. Um, so don't let that go to waste. This is an, I, an example of what I would call like a full value statement where you're getting past that first section which is the, what you, the answer to what you do and then you're moving on to include more detail about your relevant experience and your strengths about the work that you might be pursuing and then also about identifying um, additional connections or referrals that they might have for you. And you have got, oh, I'm gonna leave that up there you have got a blank version of this in your handout. So this is something that you can continue to work on as well. And I would say when, when you get the what do you do answer that you're happy with, plug that in the top spot and then work out what you would say for the other ones. And this is again a great thing um, to work on with a friend that's you know, willing to hear you out and give you some feedback. It might be another um, job search buddy that you have or a career coach could help you with this as well. So this example that's up here is of a value statement for a job seeker who has some experience but wants to switch from corporate to nonprofit work. Um, the value statement information can, you can also use whatever you craft here. It could be incorporated into your resume, it could be incorporated into your LinkedIn profile, to cover letters, so there's a lot of different ways that you can use this information. Um, and the idea is that you want this to be very conversational. So you're gonna need to do a little practice, a little memorizing, um, and you wanna be able to, to talk about this in like 30 to 60 seconds. Like we don't want any long monologue going on here because again, we're going for casual, conversational, and we're trying to connect with somebody. Um, your initial contact, your emails, your phone calls, your conversations and networking, the informational interviews and the job interviews, the thank you notes and the follow up, all of this should ideally fit together kind of like a puzzle that promotes you exactly the way you wanna be promoted, going back to that idea of branding. And networking is an ongoing process. A lot of times people um, get into job search, they've lost their job or they're changing careers, and they say, oh, I wish I had this, I wish I'd built up this big network. And then they really, really concentrate on their network during their job search, but then as soon as they get a job, they completely ignore their network. And so what I'm saying to you is that this is kind of a before, during, and after situation. This is something that you need to constantly um, be working on, staying in touch with people. It doesn't take a lot of work. Um, you can, even if you wanna, you know, often you can use one article and you can go, oh, I know like 20 people that I'm in, that I'm in contact with that would find this interesting. And you could send that to them and just say, you know, hey, how's it going, thought of you, you know, do you wanna get together? Um, but you should continue to refine or develop your goals and your objectives, your brand or your message, and your outreach in order to create these opportunities. And then find positions that are gonna be more satisfying for you and that will use your unique strengths. And remember that what you want, the value you offer, and how you convey the message all come together in those written and verbal communications. And how you position yourself or market yourself is what's gonna create the connection, the connection and the opportunity for you. So I wanna talk a little bit about LinkedIn. Does everybody here have a LinkedIn profile? Yeah, I see like two hands, really? Okay, if you don't have a LinkedIn profile, you gotta have a LinkedIn profile. 
And if you're intimidated by it and you don't know how to get started, LinkedIn has tutorials about how to get your profile up and running. And they have tutorials on YouTube too. It's very, very easy. Um, I would highly suggest that that's one of the first things that you get done. Because like I said, people will try and find you or get to learn about you through LinkedIn. So it is important. Um, in term, it's the number one uh, resource for positioning and marketing yourself. Uh, hiring managers and recruiters use LinkedIn as their number one source for finding candidates. So that's why I always say LinkedIn is a must. You know, they used to have these big files of everybody that they knew and recruiters would call and say, I'm looking for a candidate for this. They don't do any of that anymore. They go straight to LinkedIn and they search by search terms and keywords and that's how they find people. Um, and you wanna be sure to do some simple things like add your email address and your cell phone to your number to your LinkedIn profile. And then these tips up here, and I mentioned this before, um, in your Gmail account, um, on your laptop and in your smartphone, always put your phone number and your direct LinkedIn link, I mean direct link to your LinkedIn profile. Um, and then anytime that you're sending anything out or receiving anything, people have access to that information and they can, they can see what's going on with you. If they wanna call you instead of looking at your email, then it's easy because your phone number's right there. So that's, that's one thing I would recommend that everybody does for sure. Um, also complete your LinkedIn profile 100%. Most people don't do this, but it's important because you have higher vis visibility. A lot of people don't wanna put a photo in, but a lot of times people, people will open a LinkedIn profile, like a recruiter, and if it doesn't have a picture, a lot of times they'll leave the profile. So it's just odd LinkedIn behavior, but I'm telling you that you should have a photo up there because it could hurt your chances. Um, and then try to think of who you could get recommendations for for your LinkedIn profile if you haven't done that already because they carry a lot of weight. And don't forget to include your volunteer work. About 40% of hiring managers admit to being influenced by a candidate's volunteer work and using it as part of their hiring decision. A lot of times we think that doesn't matter, but it does matter because it speaks to your character and your interests outside work and future employers wanna know that. Um, and then also get other people that you know that aren't on LinkedIn uh, to get on LinkedIn. And once you're a pro, you can help everybody do it. Um, but if you have a profile and you wanna learn more about LinkedIn, um, CTC coach Howard Fox does two monthly LinkedIn webinars that are at a very, very low cost. They're on Tuesday nights, I believe. And the topics um, are about building your brand on LinkedIn, how to use and find it for find job openings on LinkedIn, um, how to research companies and find contacts, and then how to use groups and posts to establish yourself as a professional expert in the field on LinkedIn. As I said before, it's the number one professional networking site and tool in the world. I think that there are 200 million people on LinkedIn. It's an astounding number. Um, and it expands your network with relevant new contacts. If you've never been on LinkedIn before and you join LinkedIn, they'll figure out who you know from the contacts that you do have and make suggestions of who else you should, you should connect with. So it's pretty easy. Um, and it's a simple and efficient way to keep connected with your network. Um, and you're keeping in front of everybody with the posts that you make and the updates to your profiles, things like that. Um, it enhances your visibility and your marketability. Um, and you can use LinkedIn company profiles to prepare for your interviews and your outreach, which is great. You can find out a lot about a company um, by looking at their page on LinkedIn. And it allows you to search for jobs all over the whole entire world, if any of you are thinking about relocating. And um, recommendations and endorsements, um, those features will reinforce your credibility, your brand, and your qualifications and skills. And it also helps you to find and reconnect with those past colleagues, supervisors, um, and alumni that I talked about before. Some of those weak acquaintances or, or weak ties, dormant ties that I talked about before. And it also, one of the, my favorite things about it is that it offers industry-specific insight news and articles by thought leaders in your field. So you can join, um, you can follow different people that you um, professionally admire or just to get news specifically about your industry. And that helps you too when you're networking because you can kind of talk about the latest things that you've been reading 
and, um, and it sends the information right to you. It's right there, so it couldn't be any easier. So I'm gonna talk about, um, before we finish, because I read something else yesterday that reminded me, that I really wanted to talk to you today about following up. Um, I read this great article about, they called it closing the loop, and they said it was the secret to great networking. And it's one of those things that, as I said before, does take some time to do all of this follow-up and all of this thank you. But if you think about it, the people that you're following up and thanking are the people that are helping you. So you wanna encourage them because you want them to know you appreciate it, but there may be more help and more leads and more contacts there. So those people that are taking the time to help you now, you wanna make sure they know that you appreciate it. So I talk about how showing appreciation is a must. You wanna write and send thank you notes immediately. Um, you can follow up with a written note if you like. People always ask, should I send a written note? Um, but I always say email's kind of the gold standard and it's fast. Sometimes people do both. So whatever you like, but I would say, you know, email is, is fast, so I would say, um, Try and think of doing that first. And then always thank the, anybody that facilitated your contact with that person as well. Um, and remember to express appreciation by always asking what it is that you could do in return to help them out. Um, you wanna stay in touch and reach out um, and periodically check in or meet with the key contacts in your list, kind of figure out who are my most important ones. I wanna you know, maybe follow up with them the most and then who can I you know, maybe follow up with less? And send out brief updates on your job search. I led a job search accountability group at CTC for a year, and this worked out really well for some of my members. They, they just figured out a list of people that were kind of their key contacts, and they sent them individual emails, not a batch email, but it might be the same exact content, and all they do is change the, the to address. But, um, but giving them you know, these updates about this is what happened, this is who I interviewed with. Or the other thing that happens is a lot of times if you were changing careers like I was, um, you started out thinking that you were looking for one thing and then, uh, and then a month or two later you may have switched your focus. And so the only way to let these people know is to update them. Um, they might still be looking for, you, for leads for you in something that you're not even interested in doing anymore. So you need to make sure that they know about any changes to your search, any new target companies that you've added that you're interested in, that sort of thing. And then you wanna make sure that you're helping them out as well. Um, it's kind of easy to forget because when you're in job search, um, you know, you have your concerns, you might be feeling a little bit needy, you might be thinking, well, what can I do for them? But the fact of the matter is that you never know what you can do for them. They may have a charity and they might need somebody to help out in an event for one night, and you could do that as a way to pay them back, and guess what? You're gonna meet a lot of other people at that event. So always ask them if there's something that, that you can help them out with. Um, and I like to introduce my connections to other connections I have that I think they should know. And that's another way that is a cost-free way to help two people in your network. You might think, oh my gosh, you two people are so alike, or you two guys love golf, or you're both in uh, chemical sales, that type of thing. And you can make really beneficial introductions to people, and that costs you nothing, but they're really, really gonna appreciate it. And then I was talking about endorsements and recommendations before. So you're in a place right now where you wanna be asking for them to put them on your LinkedIn account. Um, but you also can be giving back, and again, at zero cost to you, by sending recommendations and giving people endorsements in your list. Another thing I like about the endorsement is um, that I also call that kind of another soft landing. So if there's somebody that you haven't talked to in your network for a while, and they pop up on your screen, and it says, endorse so-and-so, and it gives you some options, this is a really easy way to reconnect with somebody because you can look at what's up there and say, okay, what can I endorse them for? Endorse them, they'll get that endorsement probably within a day. And then after that, you could follow up with an email like, hey, you know, you just popped up on my screen, I sent you an endorsement, I'd love to get together for a cup of coffee. So it's kind of an easy way to reconnect with somebody. Um, and then, let's see about shaping about your brand. Just think about how you engage with those that you know and your LinkedIn network. 
um, and stay really relevant and purposeful in those communications. And you know, post industry related articles on LinkedIn, that also establishes you as somebody that's kind of like in the know, following the trends as an expert as well. And then also consider writing or speaking opportunities because that helps to establish you as a thought leader in your industry as well. And then after you land your new job, um, send a broadcast email to your whole network sharing your good news and then individual emails or notes to anybody who helped you in particular. And make sure everybody gets your new work email and your new work phone number. Um, if you've had to change your cell phone, that type of thing, let them know. Um, and give credit to those who helped you. You know, thank you for the role that you played in my transition. Be sure to let me know how I can be a resource for you. Um, people love to hear that. And update your LinkedIn profile with your notifications on so everybody knows that you got your new job. Um, and just keep building what you've started. That's the most important thing about all of this. Um, stay in touch with your network so it's there and it's even stronger the next time that you need it. The idea with building this network is not to build it only when you need it. It's to feed it and build it as you grow because it's going to be the source that helps you get your positions for the rest of your life. Um, and at this point, when you're in your new job, it's your turn to start helping other people now. Okay? So this concludes Networking for Connection and Opportunity. So thank you very much for joining us tonight. Um, I especially want to thank uh, National Lewis University and for their continued support of CTC. And I hope the ideas that we shared tonight will kind of shift Maybe the way you've been thinking about networking, energize your approach a little bit, um, improve your outreach communications, lead to some you know, authentic connections, and also increase your ability to target into those, uh, or to network into those target organizations. Um, and then you also have a resources handout, but I think we're a little bit over time, so I'm not gonna go through that, but what I tried to do was include um, links to a lot of the content that I talked about today. So if you want to learn more about those weak ties, there's a video associated with the what do you do question, that type of thing. You're going to find a lot of that on the resources page. Okay? So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Laura. Great job. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Kimberly Michelson. I'm the Director of Alumni Relations here at National Lewis University. Thank you guys all so much for being here. Um, I hope you found tonight's session very informative and helpful. And uh, as you can see on the center of your table, we have another one in May that is going to be a panel of National Lewis University alumni speakers assembled so you can hear it from the pros. These are folks who have graduated from National Lewis University, just like many of you have or may be uh, getting ready to do. And so we want you guys to have the opportunity to network with some of your alumni peers. And uh, so that event is also going to occur right here on May 6th. If you have any questions about that program or anything else, you can contact me. My contact information is on our website, nl.edu. Go to the alumni tab, and you can see my name liberally all throughout Kimberly Michelson. You can email me. You can call me anytime. I love hearing from you, and I love being able to connect you to resources that are helpful. While you are on our alumni page, please make sure that if you are an alum of National, you update your contact information so you can start getting our email uh, newsletter, which occurs monthly, and our quarterly magazine, which we publish both in printed version and in e-reader, so you can have access to that no matter what. And please make sure you see the gentleman in the back with the striped tie. His name is Dan. He is for here from our enrollment group. Perhaps tonight has inspired you to continue ed your education or seek some education here at National Lewis University, and he's the man who can hook you up with those types of things. So one more time, let's give it up for Laura. Thank you so much.